Okay, I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, um, although he needs a little introduction, Peter Gatley. He's among New Zealand's, New, Zealand, New Zealand's premier geneticist and general manager of Maui Milk, previously head of genetics at LIC. Maui is embarking on an exciting development phase this coming year, and we very much look forward to his presentation. So welcome to the stage, Peter. Thank you. Right, well, this is the question we all face. We spent a lot of time thinking about this. Somebody sent me the answer. It looked pretty simple. I think all this does is reinforce how difficult it is. I mean, if you want to release a new iPhone, you've got to be prepared to invest a lot of money to create it. You have to be extremely innovative, work very hard for a long time, and then you get to milk sheep. I mean, yeah, the way we're going about it is slightly different, but you still need a lot of money, a lot of time. You need to be creative. You need to work pretty hard. Um, we've uh, been applying ourselves to this task for the last two years, drawing on the expertise of a lot of people, uh, contacts from different parts of the world, certainly everyone we know in New Zealand in the dairy industry, um, dairy sheep, great relationship with spring sheep, um, you know, ag research, uh, the MB program. Um, we don't have the answers yet, but we have some things that we'd like to test, and it's interesting how much they overlap with what Thomas has just talked about. Remarkable how we're, um, we're progressing. We're taking a slightly different approach to some things, but in essence, there is a, a lot in common. So the objective is productivity. We have very low productivity in our milking sheep systems in New Zealand at the moment, among the, the larger operators anyway. Um, I know the, the guys operating on a smaller scale are getting a much better yield per U, but that's really what's killing us is the low yield per U. We've got a lot of fixed costs. So the aim is productivity improvement, and there's a lot of things that contribute to that. Um, this is a description of you know, how we see productivity. It's the relationship between inputs and outputs. Um, we know that our inputs are largely fixed. You know, we have farms, infrastructure, X number of U's, maintenance cost, labor cost of, of milking, whether it be twice a day or once a day. The big difference is whether your ewes are producing 100 litres in a lactation or 200 or 300 or potentially more. Um, the graph here that you see actually is um, real uh, data uh, based on US agriculture um, in total over quite a number of years. And you can see you know, the holding of costs, the increase in output and um, the resultant impact on productivity. It's effectively what we aim to achieve. Um, right at the beginning, we need to think about location, location of our farming operation um, for practical reasons. It's a dairy business. We don't really want to be more than a couple of hours from the factory. Our factory at the moment is in Hamilton. That's why we're looking, you know, between sort of Taupo and Auckland. Having said that, when we, when we look at the other requirements, um, you know, we need fertility, obviously. We, we really like a free draining soil. It's good for foot health and so on. Um, in an environment where facial eczema is not normally an enormous challenge. Uh, that sort of encourages us to focus around Taupo. We're pretty pleased with the decision we made there, um, albeit that you know, we've, we've, uh, we've got the benefit of, of um, uh, some experience gleaned over a number of years at the Waituriku, Waitui Kurito Trust Farm, which has been milking for quite a while, as you know. Um, the second farm was purchased at, uh, add to the milk supply um, fortuitously was only about 15 minutes away. That's a benefit. Um, the other benefit is that you know we, we really think this catchment's got a lot to offer, um, but we have found in the last year that it's not totally free of facial eczema challenge by any stretch, albeit 2016 was a uh, particularly uh, bad year for facial eczema. Uh, a lot of people, it's amazing the inquiry I get from farmers who are interested in sheep milking and they assume that when you say sheep you mean you know you can do it on hill country and we just don't think that's really the go at all we, you know you really do need a good proportion of tractor country you need to be you can't be taking your your um, your animals off um, off hill country you know in terms of you know the movement issues and so on but also the productivity and the, and the requirement for cropping a very high value feed um, so for that reason we're pretty pleased with this farm you can see it's got some it's got some uh, hill country, but there's, there's quite a lot of flat as well. So this is the new farm that we're in the process of converting at the moment, the intention of milking in the spring, as you see right on the shores of Lake Taupo. 
which raises this issue. Uh, the nitrogen discharge allowance, you know, in Taupo, every farm has a specific value attached to it. And the value attached to this farm in terms of the amount of nitrogen we're allowed to leach is quite low because the previous owner sold some of his rights uh, elsewhere. That's forced us to, um, to look really hard at the number of ewes we run and to consider whether or not we can afford to have cattle on the place to help control pasture. Um, so um, uh, at the moment we do have a few cattle on the place um, that we don't belong to us. They're just there for a little while to help tidy up and then they'll be gone. But um, you know, we're really wrestling with this because we are right on the margins. If we can make a success of this at 11 kgs of nitrogen per hectare, that is really exciting. Because as it says on the slide there, your typical sheep and beef farm has a, uh, an NDA higher than that. In terms of breeding, I'm not going to say much about this. Uh, Jake is going to discuss this in more depth uh, this afternoon. Uh, we simply uh, uh, are applying uh, a knowledge of genetics to, um, to try and create opportunities for ourselves in the form of um, genetic diversity and hybrid vigour. Um, but one thing that there is no discussion about is where the source genetics come from. They come from Europe, East Friesian, Lacone. Uh, in our view, in the fullness of time, uh, we'll stick our necks out now and say we believe that Lacone will have a bigger contribution to the future milking sheep in New Zealand than any other breed, but we still like the idea of genetic diversity um, and hybrid vigour. We love the Kiwi cow and we can see the same principles operating in sheep. In terms of feeding, I mean, it's essential to have high quality feed right from birth. If you're going to get animals pregnant, mating hoggets and expecting to, well, you know, we'd like to see them 50 kgs at mating um, and, um, and lambing down at 70 kgs. You don't do that without, you know, taking every opportunity, you know, right from the beginning. Uh, we, uh, we've had some pretty positive experience last year with short rotation ryegrass taking us through the winter, early lactation, early spring period uh, and we think lucerne has got a huge role to play and um, so we've, we've done a lot of planting of lucerne. Um, we particularly like the fact that it can be grazed or used as cut and carry or conserved in the form of silage. It also offers us the ability to protect our sheep from facial eczema get them off grass pastures at this time of the year um, when spore counts are rising. In shed feed, I mean, that's a given. Um, the additional energy is uh, a significant factor. Um, but we have to get these animals, you know, comfortable to, to go to the shed. We have to give them a reason to go to the shed. Um, we want them to step onto a moving platform and we want them to relax and let their milk down. So that's a given. In the past, we've used straight barley. We're interested in whether there's something that's more um, beneficial, um, but so far we haven't found it. This is a shot uh, taken recently of the farm showing um, our new lucerne. This is probably in the early stages of, of establishment. 135 hectares of brand new lucerne. It's quite spectacular. And right now we're in the process of putting in about 100 hectares of new grass, short rotation ryegrass. So we're going to be pretty well equipped in the coming season um, to achieve the feeding levels that I talked about. Barns, uh, uh, not a big fan of barns myself. I mean, um, after 22 years in the dairy industry, personally, my own philosophy, I love once a day milking, I love all grass, and that's what I would do with sheep if I could but I don't think we can. And so for the exactly the same reasons that Thomas just outlined, uh, we're intending to operate a hybrid system and make some use of barns. Uh, these sheep have the capacity to um, deliver a lot of milk, but they need to be looked after. I mean, we know with cows, there's everything. There's everything from robotic milking right through to all grass once a day, and the different cows can handle that. Goats pretty much need to be inside. The sheep, we think we're heading towards, you know, as I say, the hybrid system where we make use of, um, of some, you know, barns to protect the animals from all of the things they need to be protected from. And there's a long list there. Yeah, another couple of points to just make about the, the barn system. Um, we're interested in how the barn can enable us to increase the size of the milking platform. And also we've got water restrictions. I mean, we're only allowed 15 cubes of water um, you know, is an automatic entitlement in relation to, you know, a, a title. Um, but our understanding is that if we take it off the roof and store it, 
um, in tanks, you know, you, we can do what we like with the with the water, which makes sense because we're only going to return it back uh, to the groundwater, you know, eventually anyway. And we can we can store a lot of water off those big barn roofs. Every mill turns into a lot of litres. You know, so if we think of this slide as the entire farm, you know, if we had a you know purely and simply a once a day system uh, without the barn, then you know the milking platform is is going to form only part of that farm. If we have one or two once a day mobs, we can stretch the milking platform out even further, and by using the cut and carry um, silage system, um, you know we can we can reach all corners of the farm. So we're really interested to see. Um, whether we can create an integrated system to optimise the efficiency of the fundamental resource we've got, which is 770 hectares. This is the um, type of shed we're intending to, to build, um, constructed by Barfoot. Um, we particularly like the design of it. We see the role of this farm. as It's a demonstration farm. It's a promotional tool for the business. So we didn't just want to slap up a corrugated iron shed. Um, so this is the type of uh, milking shed we're putting in. This is the platform that we're intending to put in. You saw um, in the presentation from GEA yesterday. This is one just the other side of Hamilton that's been installed for goats. Um, Jake spotted these things when he was in France looking at the genetics and come back and said, well, I've found the best genetics, all right, but we need to have a closer look at these internal French rotaries. So, uh, I think it's fantastic that um, you know Spring Sheep have taken a different approach, um, and we'll have the opportunity to compare the efficiency. We believe that there is a potential labour efficiency advantage with the internal rotary, but we are conscious of the fact that you know usually there's a trade-off with these things. I mentioned here that the sheep must be trained. I think the training requirement um, to use the internal rotary, where the sheep have to step onto the platform and turn around and put the head in the head bale is perhaps, you know, we'll find a bit more challenging than the conventional rapid exit system. But we'll give it a go. It's not like it hasn't been done before. Our French friends have put a lot of effort into developing the system. This is actually a short video clip. Is it possible to click on that and play it? Oh, there you go. Um, so this is a, a, you know, a relatively small internal rotary. Um, you know, looks a bit different to the picture I just showed you, it's probably pretty old. I just wanted to show you because you can see what's happening here with you know, one person putting the cups on. I've actually timed him, I think he's doing about one every 3.75 seconds, so he's doing like eight or 900 an hour, pretty much on his own. Uh, the other guy there is waiting for something to do, um, uh, and he'll shortly find something to do. I mean, the sheep are, you know, they're selected for utter confirmation and and temperament, um, you can see that they don't all behave themselves all of the time. Um, but you know, there's two people in the shed there, and um, the throughput is pretty impressive. So um, you know, we love the you know the simplicity, simplicity of the system, but it does require that we have the sheep behave themselves. And we've got you know more than 2,000 to train up this year. I guess in a normal year you've just got your replacements, but this year we've got the whole lot to train. So if you're um, if you're not busy around September, October, come and see us. <laughs> Final thing I want to mention is lamb rearing, big part of the business. Um, we don't intend to leave uh, lambs on the ewes. We're too big to operate the shear milk system, where you leave the lambs on the ewes and milk the ewes once a day for a month or so and then transition into the shed. Um, we take the lambs off uh, on the existing farm, we've been leaving them on for 48 hours, get the colostrum and then we rear the lambs. Um, in a conventional nursery to get them going on the multi-teat feeders, no fancy um, automatic feeders, just these multi-teat feeders and then we've used a system of pens with these little half round shelters uh, with about 36 in a pen, so 40 teats there, 36 lambs, works extremely well. Uh, the, you know, the credit for this has to go to our farm manager who developed the idea. Ross um, put a lot of work into this. Um, it wasn't all plain sailing because it was a really ugly grey wet spring 
and we had some challenge from pneumonia, which we think we originated in the in the nursery area, which was in covered yards, not ideal. We're going to change the nursery area, and um, the other big thing that we've uh, we've got in mind uh, for the coming year. Oh, this just shows the, the the transition. So you go from the nursery into the pens with about 36 in a pen, where they can run around outside and get a bit of sunshine, nibble a little bit of grass. The first sign of rain, they all run inside and stand and look out at the weather. You know, which is quite neat. We wondered, you know, whether they'd figure that out. They they seem smart enough to do that, uh, and then they go in big mobs into these paddocks where we would feed about 70 at a time by simply opening the gate, counting in. You know, about 70. Uh, they all feed. They go through into the next pen, open the gate, let 70 run in. They're all queuing up. Um, you know, we can feed. You know. 1,500 lambs in an hour and a half sort of thing with just multi-teat feeders. I think there's a lot going for this system. The biggest thing we can do to enhance the system is halve the number of lambs we're rearing. So we rear males and females. This year we're interested in rearing only the females on our farm because they're the only ones we actually need. The males, um, we are interested if we can find breeders, rearers, who are um, professional in their approach and who we can rely on to do a good job, we will, uh, we're prepared to deliver the male lambs to them, right to their gate, free of charge. They're theirs to keep. We might even go a step further and um, supply some milk powder for the right people. So um, if, you, uh, if you're interested in rearing some lambs this spring, we have several thousand. Um, <laughs> To make it worthwhile entering into an arrangement with a rearer, we probably want people who will take sort of at least 500. I mean, if it's less than that. I mean, our attitude to lamb rearing has changed. A couple of years ago, none of us had ever reared more than a couple of dozen orphan lambs, and now we've just done 4,000, so we get a bit casual about, you know, you know, 500, no problem. You need to be, you know, interested in taking 500 or more, and if that's the case, then, you know, we don't need a large number of rearers, but they'll be hand-picked, vetted, and um, you know the standards will need to be high, because um, we all know why we're doing this. You know, it's an animal welfare issue, and it's, it reflects on the on the image of our of our whole industry. So it has to be done well. But if that's got any appeal to you, if you know somebody that could be interested in that, uh, yeah, you sing out. So that's it from me. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, we've a bit tight for time, so um, we can take a question while the next speaker is getting organised, if you like. Could yeah. I could, could I just commend you on that, that lamb rearing? Um, obviously, we're at a very small scale, and at, at markets where we sell our cheese, we're repeatedly asked what happens to the lambs. And I just can't say enough to commend you on that because it's a step you're taking on behalf of the whole industry. Great. 